and join me. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echa, Baruch Shem Kevod Machuto, Leolam Ba'ed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his glorious name, whose kingdom is forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And uh, what we're going to do now is we're also going to sing the blessing over the reading of the Torah. So if uh, you, you can join me. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Bakar Banu Mikol Hami Benatan lanu et torato, Baruch etadonai, notain ha Torah. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all the peoples and gave to us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, the giver of the Torah. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to get started now. Well, you guys should have did the Hamotzi earlier, okay? <laughs> Amen. Amen. You know, before we get started, before we get started, I want to give you guys an update because uh, <clears throat> what we need to do is we need to pray for Elder Reuben. Uh, I did go and uh, visit with him yesterday, and I sat with him, Peggy and I, for a for uh, right around a couple hours, and um, he was able to speak to us. Granted, there's times there we got to get real close to him to hear what he had to say, but but he can speak. But uh, Reuben needs nothing short of a miracle. Uh, we need to pray that the Lord would would step in, um, hear our prayers, and and heal Reuben because that's that's what Reuben needs. Reuben needs a miracle. So right now, if we can all in agreement, lift him up to the Lord. Father, uh, we thank you, Lord, for Reuben. Yes. Reuben is an awesome man of God. Yes. He's been part of this congregation for many years, Lord. And we ask, Father, for that miracle, Father. You are the God of miracles, Lord. And we ask that, that you turn the tide on his health, Father and that he becomes healthy and, and, and all yes. everything, all his vitals are be, become functionable, Lord. Um, Father, we are asking for a miracle for our brother Reuben, Lord, that you would heal your son, Lord. And we ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 We got there right after we left. Right after we left? And yeah. He opened his eyes and smiled when we came in, and that was all. That was it? Okay, Pastor Bruce was there too <clears throat> to see Reuben. And uh, oh, you know what I should do? I should probably turn on my microphone. <laughs> so, so let me get let me get my microphone on, even though I know some of you do hear me. Okay, that that better? Yes. All right. Okay, Pastor Bruce did go visit with Reuben too when uh, Peggy and I were there. Uh, uh, we walked in and uh, right away he looked up and said, Vincent. So, uh, you know, so he, and he spoke with us. He spoke with Peggy. He spoke with me. We, we had a talk. He, all his family there is there. So that's wonderful that he's able to see his family. One thing he wanted to do is he wanted to pass on a blessing to all his children. And, uh, and he has been able to do that, but, uh, but, uh, you know, he, like I said, uh, he needs a miracle, a miracle healing, and we serve a God of miracles. So, you know, why not, Lord? Why not, Reuben? So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, we're going to get started. Uh, Todot, uh, to Genesis 25, 19 to 28, 9. We're not going to be able to hit on everything. But we'll get as much as we can, and uh, and the, where I would like to start 
is let's read Genesis chapter 25. We're going to begin in verse 19, and we're going to read it all the way to the end of uh, 25. So uh, follow along as uh, we read uh, uh, Genesis uh, chapter 25, 19 uh, to the end of the chapter. Now these are the records of the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethul, the Aramean of Padam Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to, to be his wife. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. And the Lord answered him, and his wife, Rebekah, conceived. But the children struggled together within her. And she said, if it is so, why am I in this condition? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. And two peoples will be separated from your body. And one people will be stronger than the other. And the older will serve the younger. When her days leading to the delivery, delivery were at an end, behold, there were twins in her womb. Now the first came out red, all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. Afterward, afterwards, his brother came out, and his hand was holding on to Esau's heel. Uh, so he was named Jacob, and Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a civilized man living in tents. <laughs> I'm, this is the New American Standard. <laughs> now, Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. When Jacob had cooked a stew one day, Esau came in from the field, and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, Please let me have a mouthful of that red stuff there, for I am exhausted. Therefore he was called Edom by name. But Jacob said, First sell me your birthright. Esau said, Look, I'm about to die. So, if, so of what use then is the birthright to me? And Jacob said, first swear to me. So he swore an oath to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil soup, stew, and he ate and drank. He got up and went on his way. So Esau despised his birthright. The Torah portion begins with these words. These are the records of the generations of Isaac. So uh, in Roman numeral one, todot equals generation or generations. When reading the Torah, you find that there is much written about Abraham and Jacob, but not a whole lot about Isaac. Isaac was not a whole lot. Well, Isaac, there's times where you would look at the Isaac and say that, you know, he's not like his father. But then at other times, he was just like his father. So, uh, but like I said, um, Isaac is like considered a bridge uh, between Jacob and Abraham. And, um, uh, and, and with that, you're going to find a lot, when we get further on in the Torah, we'll find that there's a lot written about J uh, uh, Jacob, and there's a lot written, that we've already read a whole lot about Abraham. But Isaac, there just isn't a whole lot about him. Maybe he, it's because he wasn't the rowdy one of the bunch. You know, he was, uh, and he did uh, study, study Torah. At, at, and there's a lot of writing on it on him in the midrash uh, and you know other other sources of commentary and it was jacob who was really much 
like uh, his grandfather. He was very much like him. But like I said, what we're going to find out, there were instances there where uh, uh, Jacob, uh, he, he was, he, or Isaac was like his father. So both Abraham and Jacob had, one thing about them too, both Abraham and Jacob had a name change. Abram to Abraham and Jacob to Israel. Okay. Isaac's name never changed. And uh, it may be because, uh, maybe it was because God named him. If you turn back in your Bibles to Genesis 1719, turn in your Bibles to Genesis 1719, and it says, But God said, No, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you shall name him Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. So maybe that's why there wasn't a name change, because it was God who named uh, Isaac. You know, there's, an, uh, there's other differences uh, and, and a, a thing about between Isaac and his grandfather and, uh, and, and his son. Isaac only had one wife. That was it. Isaac and Rebecca were most likely just very happy being married together. It's kind of like today, we only have one wife, one husband. Uh, and, and he was the only pa patriarch who never left the promised land. Isaac never left the promised land. And Isaac is believed to be the first, uh, the first person born Hebrew. Isaac was Hebrew by birth. Uh, and on the eighth day, Isaac was circumcised. So he was the first child to be circumcised at eight days. Um, do you remember a few chapters ago when Abraham circus circumcised all the males? In fact, I think I was teaching it. And, uh, and Abraham had to circumcise his whole household, uh, all the males, and, and, and he did. Well, um, I have a, a question. In his, if his, in his house, household, it included Ishmael. Ishmael, so, so why is Isaac Hebrew and Ishmael is not? Have you guys ever thought of that? You figure Ishmael was circumcised. He was 13 years old at the time, but he was circumcised, and that is a mark of the covenant. But when you think about it, he is not considered a Hebrew, but yet, uh, you know, his brother brother was. So uh, uh, Ishmael is thought of as being Arab, not Hebrew. And why is this? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Read, reading from a commentary from Torah class by Tom Bradford. I don't know if any of you ever read uh, Tom Bradford's uh, writings. Uh, he has a, a website called Torah Class, and I would, uh, you know, I would encourage you that if you want to read more on the Torah, get or get another perspective. You know, there's a lot of times uh, I remember reading where a person said that I don't read anybody's commentary who is still alive. <laughs> you know, he wants to read if the person, because he says, because if the person's still alive, then they can change it if they want to. But yet if they have died, well, then, you know, it's there. It's etched in stone, their, uh, their understanding. But uh but uh, Tom Bradford, he said this, we all have physical identity, but only God establish, establishes your spiritual identity. Your physical identity and your spiritual, spiritual identity are two different matters. Um, so that the term Hebrew began by denoting much more than simple 
physical identity. Hebrew also defined a spiritual ID or a spiritual DNA. Uh, Hebrew was meant to be a term that described a combination of physical and spiritual attributes of a person. Further, the life of a Hebrew, physically and spiritually, was to operate under a set of laws and promises that God made with the first Hebrew, Abraham. Amen. So when you become Hebrew, you are changed. You are a different person. Uh, and then he goes on to say, Hebrew's earthly life was to revolve around his spiritual life. We call these laws and promises that define this overall life of Hebrew as the Abrahamic, Abrahamic uh, covenant. And later they were expanded and given to Moses. And they are now called the Torah. Tom Bradford goes on to say, so even though Isaac was physically of the right stock to be a Hebrew, it still took an act of God, an election of God, for him to be declared a Hebrew. Think about it. Ishmael was also physically of uh, the right stock. His father was Abraham. Uh, but God did not grant Ishmael the necessary spiritual st uh, status to be a Hebrew. Therefore, we have with the election of Isaac and the rejection of Ishmael an enormous fork in the road. One direction led to the Hebrews, the other one away from the Hebrews. So, you know, I've always wondered that. I've always wondered why Ishmael, he was circumcised, became, uh, so he would become Hebrew. No, this is more of a, a, a godly spiritual matter. Pastor Bruce. Yeah, if we go over to Genesis 17, uh, 20 and 21, it really uh, paints the picture for us. 17, 20 and 21 says, As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him, and I will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of 12 princes, and I will make him a great nation. Of course, that really is paralleling the blessing that is actually going to be uh, given bestowed upon Jacob later, right? Uh, but it, it's a, an equal blessing. But then in verse 21, it says, but my covenant I will establish with Isaac. Amen. Amen. So you get that, everyone? I mean, it, it's just like, you know, and I look at this, I think about today. You know, there are a lot of, uh, especially in the political arena, there are a lot of people that, uh, you know, they are, they are Jewish. They don't act it, but, you know, they, they, they claim to be Jewish. And uh, I look at them more as being Ishmael's because they're, they, the, the covenant, uh, the Abrahamic covenant, you know, it seems like that's what they're, uh, what they come up with, some of these people, it's like, uh, where are you getting this from? You know, um, God isn't with you. You know, uh, that's just my own uh, understanding or my own take of it. But, uh, you know, I just wanted to uh, put that out there. I, you know, I think that, that this is an excellent understanding because we see this again with Jacob and Esau. Uh, Isaac uh, and Ishmael were half brothers. They had different mothers. But Jacob and Esau are twins. Yeah. So they both have the same mom and dad. Yeah. You know, but we see the same thing here. What gives? Why is one, you know, Hebrew, but the other is not? It's, it's you know what? It's a God thing. Yeah. So uh, God chose Jacob over Esau. Jacob would be a Hebrew. Esau was stripped of the right to be called a Hebrew. Let me let, me let somebody in. Okay. Uh, the only difference between Jacob and Esau was the spiritual difference. 
And that was brought about purely by the declaration of God. It was, it was, it's like I said earlier, it's a God thing. Uh, you know, and thank, thank goodness. I don't know about many of you, but uh, I know like in my own family, I've got, uh, you know, there's 14 of us and uh, there's four of us that are walking with the Lord, you know, 10 are not. So we've got, uh, you know, the same parents, uh, the same DNA, uh, and, uh, but yet some decided that fork in the road, some decided to walk one direction and, and the others, you know, another direction. So, uh, and that's what we're seeing right here in this, in these families. You know, we've talked about it before too, about being a dysfunctional family. I thank, <laughs> I thank the Lord that he, you know, he works with the, his children and he brings them right back in line because boy, do we get off track many times. Okay, in verse 20, it states that Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebecca. So how old was Rebecca? Is any It doesn't say but boy if you read uh if well but if you if you read the Humash uh there's and there's some other uh sages that uh you know I've read a few commentaries that say that Rebecca was 3 years old. Oh, no. <laughs> no. You are you are absolutely right. I don't believe that. <laughs> yeah, the Talmud. Well, they, they say that because what they say is uh, Isaac was 37 at the time of the, of, uh, he was going to be sacrificed, okay? So if he was 37, and it was 20 years later be, before Rebecca gave birth, well, that takes you up to 57. How many years do you have left? He was 60 years old when, uh, when uh, Isaac uh, or when Jacob was born. So, no, but that's, that, that's why they come, come away with that understanding. So it, that is ridiculous. Well, that tells you right there that Isaac wasn't 37 years old when he was going to be sacrificed. He must have been about, nope. I would, I would, I would say that he had to be maybe uh, he was an adult, but like right around what twenty years old or something like that. Because uh, now there's other understandings, other uh, uh, commentaries that say, uh, like I said, I don't agree with that either. I, I'm with you. Remember this. Oh, remember this is the same girl who went down to the well to get water for Eleazar. Okay, and she also went down how many times to get water for all the camels? Yeah, that was a chore. You know, yeah. yes, Peggy. Yeah, I just want, do you do you think maybe they mean she was betrothed to him and not? You no, know, that's what I thought. That's what there's somebody else out there that yeah. thinks the same thing. Yeah. Uh, Yes, but I can't. I can't even. I can't even go with that. Because Eleazar traveled east to the land of the the ancestors, and uh, that's where he met Rebecca for the very first time. Yeah, <laughs> Peggy. Peggy says those sages are ridiculous. They be lying. <laughs> but uh, but okay, everybody. So. You know, and I believe, well, there, there are other commentaries that say that Rebecca was 14 years old. And that's more like it. That's more like it, you know. And that's what I believe. That's my understanding is that she was about 14 years old because I had a 14-year-old can go down, get the water, and bring it up for, uh, for uh, Eleazar and for all the camels, okay. But a three-year-old, I don't think so. But I just want to put that out there. That way, when any of you hear any of these uh, uh, comments or stories, you you've heard it before, and you know. So it you know these are the these these are the.
commentaries that are out there. In verse 21 to verse 23, we first read that Isaac prays to God on behalf of his wife, and Rebekah conceives. Okay, Rashi says that Isaac took his wife, Rebekah, to Mount Moriah. That he took her to Mount Moriah, and they both prayed there, and then she was able to conceive. So now Rebecca knows, you know, now that she conceived and uh, she's starting to look like she's pregnant, she knows that there is something wrong inside of her. <laughs> and you know, there is a Jewish legend out there that, uh, that says that Jacob and Esau tried to kill each other in the womb. They were already fighting with each other in the womb. So there was, there was conflict there. So, okay, I have a question here from Maria. So hold on, everybody. In the study that we had the, with uh, Pastor Bruce, uh -huh. that he said... Uh, How many years ago? <laughs> <laughs> what was the date, <laughs> well, I, That I don't remember. But you said that possibly when uh, Jacob grabbed the heel, it was because Esau was trying to crush his head, and he was defending himself from from his brother in the wound, not grabbing his heel. Not only that, uh, I've also read where. There was movement in there, obviously. Yeah. And at one time, uh, Jacob was, was going to be the first one to come out. You know, uh, and, and there, the, all this movement and everything, uh, Esau was able to maneuver himself to be the firstborn. While you're doing that, I'm going to grab me a pen that works. Yeah, to Maria's uh, comment, that's where that that's where the notion of they were warring in the womb comes from. Right. And and uh, so the rabbis have speculated, of course, it's just speculation, but they speculated that Esau was already trying to crush the head of Jacob, and he was defending himself. And, and of course, you know that's a little problematic because. Um, the rabbis always want to paint the Jews as. as That's from Genesis two, isn't it? Yeah. Like he will uh, crush people. Well, that's speaking of Messiah. The Messiah. And, and well, they were, Satan. I guess they were trying to make this the Messiah that he would crush his head, and he was trying to protect his head. Okay. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't read that, but uh, well, I mean, I could see. Oh, okay. Uh, it, was, it was Bruce who said that. Uh, Gary needs Gary needs a microphone, huh? What did I say? Let's fact check this. <laughs> yes, Gary. Two points. One. God here. Is that on? Is that turned on? Green light. God may have foresaw what Esau was going to do by selling his birthright. So therefore, you know, because he transcends time and space, it was perhaps Esau that chose to give up the birthright mm -hmm. and not so much a predestination on God's part. Right. And secondly, it describes Esau as a mighty hunter of the field, yeah. is there a correlation between him, characterologically wise, and Nimrod? You know, I, I didn't, you know, you've got a good point there. <laughs> you know, wait, well, hold on, you've got a good point there, um, you know, because uh, you're right, you know, but I think what we, we stated earlier, well, I've been uh, some kind of a feed. Yeah, it might be, did you turn that mic off? 
the mic's pretty hot. It so. is okay, but but like I said, I think that's a very good point because uh, I think we get right back to what we were saying earlier that it's a God thing. God knows, uh, you know, it's a, it's spiritual. You know, it's one thing to be born uh, a Jew or being born Hebrew, but spiritually, are you acting like a, a Jew or are you acting Hebrew? Even today, us Christians, I mean, Christians, you know, uh, are we acting like Christians? You know, what speaks louder? You know, your words or your action? Right. But does that go back to character? And I mean, my mother-in-law thought I was adopted because I'm so different from my family. Uh -huh. You know, so is it based upon the innate character of a specific individual, which character determines the ethics and the choices that you make? Right. That God perhaps foresaw that type of character in one or that type of character not in the other to project into the future those characteristic traits, perhaps genetically, right. that would go and transcend generations to come. You know, it very well may be. I, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going to argue that because I know that the Lord knows us uh, before we even came out of the womb. He already knew us, you know, so, uh, you know, and in the future time, there's going to be more people that are going to come out that are going to be like uh, like Esau and like Jacob. You know, uh, were you going to say something, Linda? Get a, get the, the microphone. Like Harry. Okay. My question, because I'm fairly new in Messianic. Um, I thought, I don't know the difference because you keep, you mentioned several times and so it, it like opened my mind up. You're saying Hebrew and Jew? Well, uh, a Hebrew. I thought a Jewish, a Jew yeah. was Hebrew. Uh, well, Hebrew I, was the language. Right. At this time, I should just be saying Hebrew, you know, I because that, that language, but no, that's the, well, they don't even become Jews until the time of, uh, when they leave, uh, uh, Egypt, Egypt. And right. Then... Yeah. So this is before they're, uh, even in Egypt. So right now they are called Hebrews. Okay. Yeah. What number is that, Mike? What number, number is that, two? I turned it off now. I've got a comment on this as soon as. Uh, okay. okay. You discussion on a Nimrod connection? You know what? Uh, I didn't go there. The Nimrod connection that Gary is bringing up, I didn't go there. But, uh, but you know, when you read something in. Uh, in the word that, you know, this guy was a skillful hunter, you know, Nimrod was a, but Nimrod was also a hunter of men, you know, so it didn't phase him one bit if he took the life of a, of another person. And then now here you are reading it again about another skillful hunter. Um, you know, there, there obviously some type of correlation there, you know, why, yeah, why would you put, yeah, you're right. Why would you put, you know, you say it once, well, okay. You say it twice, well, now it's more important. Okay, Pastor Bruce. You know, uh, kind of going to Gary's comment, not on Nimrod so much, but on the predestination aspect. If you turn into Romans chapter 8, uh, starting in verse 28, we always read this, but we actually pull this scripture out of context probably 90% of the times we use it. And what it says is, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and for those who are called according to his purpose. Then we have in verse 29, the very first word is a conjunction. It's a conjunctive word. So it ties this together. So this is yeah. actually part of the same statement it says for those whom he foreknew he also predestined to become 
conform to the image of the sun. And this differentiates the Hebrew from the Jew. <laughs> yeah, the, absolutely. The Jew is a biological uh, scenario. The Hebrew is one who crosses over spiritually. So one who uh, becomes a child of God, if you will, through through faith and belief. So he, he predestined those to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So you can see that whole progression there. Yes. Uh, predestination is a very real thing, but it's but the qualifier is right there at 29 for those whom he foreknew, right? It's predestined, it's predestination through foreknowledge. So he had foreknowledge of the difference between Esau and Jacob, Cain and Abel, uh, your four siblings and the other ten, right? It's, he has. And of course, that story is still working itself out. Yes. So that may not be the final tally, uh, but we don't know that. Only the Lord knows that. But if the Lord knows the tally, which we believe He does in Vince's case, then those folks, those brothers and sisters, are already predestined. And therefore, they're going to be predestined, they're going to be called, they're going to be justified, and they're going to be glorified. <coughs> yeah. It's already a done deal, because God knows which ones are going to cross over, mm -hmm. and which ones won't. Yeah. yeah. You know, before I go any further, uh, letter A, you're going to turn it down? Okay. Letter A, the children of Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. That's, that's what we're talking about now. The children of Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. We also already spoke of the conception of Jacob and Esau. And that's in uh, number one. The conception of Jacob and Esau. Okay, now we'll, we'll move on. Let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, in verse 24, it says that Rebekah went to inquire of the Lord. Not good. Uh, yeah, verse 24 of, 19, of uh, 19, or, or 25, I'm sorry. Verse 24 of uh, chapter uh, 25. Well, in 24, it says that Rebekah went to inquire of the Lord. Do you remember a couple weeks ago uh, when I put on the chalkboard? Verse 22. Verse 22, is it? Okay. Uh, do you remember a couple weeks ago when I put on the chalkboard? I put a put the span of a uh, of a uh, of the or of the lifespan of a uh, of some people that are very important, uh, you know, in this text that we're talking about. Well, I want you to know that when it says that she went to inquire of the Lord, there's multiple sources there that say she went to inquire of Shem. And you think about it, Shem at that time, at, at the time of the, before the, 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 the twins were born, Shem was 550 years old. He lived to be 600 years, okay? So, like I said, there's a, there's a lot of resources there and, and, and commentaries that say that that is who she went to inquire of, because Shem was a teacher of Torah. He was, a, he was just like we have a dean of our yeshiva, uh, Shem was the, the dean of his yeshiva at that time. So, uh, so like I said, one of the, you know, uh, Shem was 550 years old when Jacob and Esau were born. The Midrash and the Humash say that this is who Rebekah went to, okay? It was here that God told Rebekah that there were two nations in her womb. That tells you something right there. For, for, for you to have twins inside of you, uh, you know, 
right there it's telling you that there's going to be conflict that the two are going to be in conflict so in verse 23 rebecca is told that the older will serve the younger in other words the physical firstborn will not receive the usual and customary rights of the firstborn blessing uh, do you realize in the middle east this is this is a, a big custom being the firstborn uh, you would get a double portion okay instead the second will be given that right the eternal importance of this matter is that the physical firstborn esau is not going to be the inheritor of this of all these promises it's going to be uh isaac or i'm sorry it's going to be jacob jacob is the firstborn on a spiritual level uh, you know so because god says it that is the way it's going to be so you know and then on a side note uh mount Z zaire in israel which is near the dead sea you know i've always said i've always told peggy i think when i finally retire from uh from working for the county uh, i think i would like to teach a geography class but that way uh, people will be able to see exactly where a lot of these places are and a lot of them have changed there's there's some uh, mountains in uh in uh in uh, israel that in the ancient times uh this this mountain you know in the north was called a certain name but then today it's in the south the name is called something you know the same name and people say well how could it be in the north and the south the names change you know well mount zaire in israel is near the dead sea uh and it's got its name from esau being born very Zaire, or Zaire. If you look up the word Zaire, it means hairy. Okay. Uh, in, in number two, Esau equals red and completely developed. And that's what they were saying that when, when he came out of the womb, when he was born, it's like he was completely developed. He was a very hairy baby. So, <laughs> so Mount <laughs> mustache. <laughs> you know, sometimes you see those. Sometimes you see those pictures. You know, where a baby has a mustache, and well, maybe this is where it came from. <laughs> um, so uh, Mount Zaire named named for the is named for the characteristics of Esau. Literally means hairy mountain okay or mount hairy if that's what you want to call it but yeah. rebecca is also told that one would be uh, stronger than the other and the older shall serve the younger i've always wondered why she did not share this with her husband you you read that she did not share this with her husband you know years later uh wouldn't that have made the blessings easier i mean wouldn't uh isaac uh had known if he had known this maybe he would not have had you know had to be deceived or or lied to he would have known that hey you know uh uh abraham passed it on to to me and now i'm passing it on to jacob you know esau is out of the picture and, and uh, like we said earlier it's just like uh ishmael and and uh isaac ishmael was the oldest but isaac is is part of the covenant you know and now jacob will be okay so uh, as we move on we find that as in and that as is common within families parents have their favorites and i know a lot of parents will say no i don't you know you know and uh and that may be true and i'd say that's probably more truer with the women i think than the men and that's just my own opinion you know because i can really say that uh 
you know, Peggy is attached to all of her children, you know, and all of the grandchildren. And that's why a lot of the grandchildren, when they call for, for anything, they don't call grandpa, <laughs> they call grandma, you know, and uh, grandma, you know, she gives them I real, say no. <laughs> well, well, that's true too. <laughs> but then it, Peggy says that unless she says no, then they'll call me. But then if they call me, I say, well, did you call grandma? <laughs> so, um, okay, Maria has a question. Go ahead, Maria. I think the reason she might have loved uh, Jacob more because he was more of a mama's boy. He he stayed with the family. Esau, I think, from the time he was a teenager, he took over. He he went out, got himself two pagan wives. I'm sure without the permission of his parents, yeah. uh, he did what he wanted to. He went hunting. And from the same lecture that the pastor gave, <laughs> that uh, he went out and he fought against Nimrod and killed him. He killed Nimrod and, the, and he had meat and he was starving to death. That's why he sold his birthright. But he was more of a, I'm taking over. Right. Isaac was okay, but don't bother me. But then the Do other you want. Yeah. And the other thing you 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 read too is that he was a studier of uh, of the word. He 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 would study the word. Remember we we covered it just a bit ago about Shem. Shem was alive at that time. So who was he studying Abraham. under? Abraham too. You're right. Gary, go ahead, Gary. It also gives another view in how Rebecca's always kind of blamed for being the sneaky, the deceptive with the blessing later on of how, you know, he told, she told Jacob to put on mm -hmm. the garments and be sneaky, sneaky, sneaky. Like right. she's a real deceptive person, but perhaps the basis of that or the motivation behind that was going back to her being told this when they were in the womb, that she was just perhaps being obedient or part of the original plan in the first place. I mean, not a sneaky, deceptive mom yeah. to get mama's boy, as you said it. Yeah. In the primary spot. Yeah. And you know, and you read both of that. And and I agree with you, Gary. I agree that she understood this covenant blessing that being passed down, you know. And then when you, you know, I like the way, uh, I was reading an article by uh, Dennis Prager, and Dennis Prager said it's kind of like having uh, somebody wants to get in. It. It's kind of like having a, a collection. Let's say, like the way he put it was, what if you had all these Shakespearean writings, a collection that was very valuable, and you have one son that was into the arts. And, uh, and he loved it. And the other son, other son that couldn't care less about it, you know, who would you give it to, you know? And he said, it's kind of like, you know, uh, like right here. I think Rebecca understood. She understood, you know, the Lord even spoke to her. So she knew full well which son uh, everything's going to be passed on to. Pastor Bruce? I think uh, the issue with uh, Rebecca getting this word, I think this addresses an issue, a real big issue in the church today. Everybody hears from God. So you, you get a word, but you don't have the confidence or the boldness to say, well, I think this might be a word. Right. And so you just keep it to yourself and you don't tell anybody else. I think that's probably what Rebecca did. Yeah. She got a word instead of bringing it to to her husband and saying, you know, I think I got a word from the Lord. What do you think? She held it in, and then it, it went unnoticed, but it still was brewing in her. 
right. hard. It, it even says that about Mary that, in the free how to shop. That's what Maria said earlier. Yeah, yeah. That, that Mary pondered the words. Yeah. And that gives you the idea that you really don't have that uh, secure posture that uh, you, you're you confident enough to say it's, it's the Lord. And I, so I would encourage the body here when you get something that is just kind of, it just has, it leaves you with that feeling that that, that thought or that, were, that, that thought, that inclination was different than normal. Right, right. And maybe that's God. And then throw it out because the word says, uh, let two or three prophesy and then let the prophets, let the let, people yeah. judge it. Yes. And people will say, nah, you know what? I think you had too much, uh, you know, chili last night or something <laughs> uh, but others might say yeah. no you know what you might have something there when people tell me uh, words that they think might be words I'll usually redirect them back to the Lord and say okay you know what you need to take that specifically to the Lord now and ask him, is that a word right yeah. well you know and I think you've shared with us many times and it and it and it is true that there's a lot of times people will come and they'll uh, share a word w even with me and and uh right away you could you you know the you, your spirit tells you that isn't a word for the congregation it was a word for you yeah. you know so uh, I think somebody on somebody yeah, wants to ask oh Colette go ahead and unmute yourself if you can hello yeah we hear you hi you know what i'm only piping in because i've heard you say this a couple of times that uh, shem was actually alive during this time and some of the commentaries have that as a you know the way that the 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 torah is um revealed but i literally i've, I've done this study um and i've been on this study for years now that there is about a 60 year discrepancy in some of the timeline yep. Yep. and um that shem was actually not alive he had actually died about 10 years before this um the birth of these twins yeah um no David, you're exactly right because there's a okay what 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 uh colette is saying that uh there are there's a uh commentaries or there's writings out there that say that Shem actually died 60 years before so Shem would have been dead for at least 10 years before any of this would have occurred you know um, like I said when when I when I put up the years that they live um, I just put them up there and uh, and how all these lives crossed each other and uh, if we go that route Shem is alive during this time and and some of the writings do say that he had a yeshiva that he was teaching and this is where uh rebecca inquired upon the lord but go ahead well, Colette, you're gonna say something else no i was gonna say the 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 torah the text does not bear that out that he actually was uh, had passed about 10 years before they were born but um but a bear was alive Abair was absolutely alive at that time. And he could have been, you know, the one that was keeping that, you know, the traditions of what was passed down to, to Noah and Shem at that time, because right. he was absolutely a teacher at that time also. So. And, and you have to realize too, even at this time, it would have been oral Torah. You're just being passed on family to family to family. Okay. Thank you for sharing, uh, Colette so uh let's let's move on so uh, in fact in number three jacob equals heel because he grasped esau's heel so the fill-in is heel and heel <clears throat> and then in number four the older shall serve the younger and that's we are where we're at right now and let me give you number five. Number five is Esau, a skillful hunter, Jacob, a mild man. And you're going to get different uh, descriptions of Jacob, and it depends where you go. Okay, 
But, uh, you know, have you ever wondered, uh, you know, you have uh, Rebecca there, but it's uh, Jacob who's doing the cooking, you know? I don't know if that's uh, unusual or, di but I think it's, uh, it's a little different, you know? Uh, we were talking about this before we even, uh, when we got here earlier this morning, and what's that? Men are oh, men, 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 men can, men can cook. Not this man, but you know, I know men can cook. <laughs> you, know, you know, so, you know, yeah, but apparently, yeah, apparently, uh, 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 Jacob was a good cook, <laughs> you know. Maria, were you going to say something? Uh, it says that Jacob was a, a peaceful man. Peaceful man. It, it, uh, in, the, in the Hebrew scripture, it says he's a, a tam, T-A-M. Is that the same as tamid, like the it, Noah? Yeah, that's the root. Yeah. So was tamim. he the same? Tamim is the, yeah, like Noah. Yeah, the righteous. It's too. the root word that comes yeah. from tamim. Yeah. And tamim, the the spotless lamb is tamim. Mm. And and when it talks about Noah was perfect in all generations in Genesis chapter six, the word that's used there, he was not righteous in the fact of doing good deeds. He was righteous in his body, his yeah. physical yeah. body. He was tamim. Yes. And that's very important to understand that because that that addresses the issue of the Nephilim and the pollution of intermixing. He was the only person on planet Earth that had not intermixed. So Jacob was Tamin, a, per, a perfect, and Esau was Nephilim? Well, I'm not going to say he was a Nephilim, but he was tainted. I think the taint, I get the impression, personally, this is my own view, that the tainting can go down for 10 generations. So just thank you, Lord. Been tainted, that, and what? I said, thank you, Lord. Yeah. <laughs> and that go that goes to the Ruth story, or not the Ruth story, but uh the, the Torah uh that addresses uh nobody uh no uh Moabite to the tenth generation can be saved. So what do we do with that scripture? You have to look at that scripture and go, okay, well, what does that mean? Uh, there's, a, there's problems with that because when you count the generations of Ruth, she falls at about nine, I believe, yeah. not 10. So this becomes extremely problematic for us. So, uh, but I think the concept is there. Remember, I'm always talking about the essence. You gotta grab the essence. When you get into the particulars, uh, the word gets pretty sticky. Yeah, like all Israel will be saved. Like all Israel yeah. will be saved. What the heck right. does that even, does that mean every Israelite's going to be saved? No, it doesn't mean that at all. But uh, those that are saved are Israel. Right. Now it makes sense. Mm -hmm. But but that's all of our input into right. the whole issue. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So he was Tamim. Yes, he was Tamim. It's I am. Yeah, but it, in the scriptures, it just has the T-A-M. Yeah, that's because when you look at Strong's, all you get is the root. No, this is my interlineage. Thank you. I'm not that familiar with that. But you have to go to something like uh, Briggs, Driver, and Brown is a very good resource. Um, for the Hebrew, and then you should get into more detail. When you just quote Strong's or or lexicons like that, um, and, uh, you run into problems. You run into problems because they've overgeneralized it. So they'll say, "Well, this word means this." Well, no, this word does not mean this. This word means this, but this word is the root for the word that means that. So when you start studying the etymology. That's the study of words. Uh, you have to really pick and choose. And Strong's yeah. is a very basic starting point. Yeah, it's good. But one thing you will find out too is uh, there are a lot of people that are they they are very 
strong in, 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 in the words like you're saying, and it doesn't mean anything else. But we have already found out when we get to the Hebrew that one word can mean, yeah. uh, you know, wow. 10 different things, wow. you know. So, yes, Gary. That would go back to the debate on the reincursion of the Nephilim post flood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were they, was it a repeat of what the angels did the first time? Or was it a genetic carryover <clears throat> that yep. uh, Noah's daughters in laws carried with them? Yep. Because you look at the descendancy from them, you know, yep. one had many giants in their lineage that perhaps. The genealogy lined up in Esau carrying a Nephilim type trait, whereas in Jacob it did not, which was the dividing at that point where one to as what Pastor Bruce was saying, right. you know, genetically weed out that chromosome to a certain generation, whereas the other that would not occur. No, you're absolutely right because when you get in beyond the flood after the flood, you know. There were giants in the land. <laughs> Somehow, you know, that chromosome or uh, DNA or what it got in there. And it could it have been the daughter in laws? Well, absolutely. The son. Uh, look at Ham. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what? I made a comment earlier and I said, thank you, Lord. And the reason I said that the 10 generations is there was one day Pastor Bruce was doing a teaching on the blood. No, not okay, <laughs> and he was saying that there's a certain blood type that is Nephilim. Okay, well, you want to know something? That's Pastor Vince's blood type. You know, <laughs> I, Busted. I was. Oh yeah. So so, but it's been beyond ten generations, everybody. So <laughs> I don't. What, what what was it? Something. Nate. Yeah. But I, I forget what I forget too. Was, but, but I yeah, but I get a phone call from my daughter, our yeah, even our granddaughter, you know, you know, am I yeah, Christine. Christine wanted to know if she was adopted. I didn't do it. My yeah, my daughter wanted to know if she was adopted because I've got this weird blood type. And then Peggy had to tell her, uh, Christine. That's your dad's blood type. Oh, okay. I, yeah. But okay, Pastor Bruce. <laughs> what was I going to say? Oh, I was going to say, you know, that like goes back to Caleb. Caleb was a, uh, he came from the uh, Kenizzites. Thank you. And the Kenizzites are listed in the 15 nations that are to be destroyed. Because they're giants, they're they're Nephilim, and so Caleb comes from that tribe. His father was uh, what was the name? Kenizzite. Thanks, the Kenizzite tribe. So this again, remember, I'm always harping on this. You cannot yeah. focus in on the minute right details, the the minutia of the word. The word is teaching us concepts. And I'm not saying the word isn't true, but the but the problem is this is not a thorough history book. Yeah, this is not a detailed history of anything. <coughs> this it, it says there were giants in the land. That's all it tells you. Right. That's not a detailed history book. It leaves everything else to our imagination, speculation. Right. But God didn't feel it was important to take the space and the time to write all of that in. You know how thick this book would be? You'd need a wheelbarrow to move it around <laughs> yeah. if, if he had detailed everything. He's only given us what we need to know for our salvation and our yeah. walk with God. Amen. Amen. There's a lot more in there. Right. But we have to kind of connect the dots, and those dots may or may, may not be correct. Right. Right. But they but they're educated, like yeah. even the, the, the blood type. Right. I, I forget where I got my information on that at the moment, but uh, I think yeah. what's happened yeah. is in the, the bones of the giants that they have found and the DNA that they have been able to connect uh, or collect, 
uh, it goes back to this same blood type every time. I, I think that's, it was, that, yeah. that's the idea. So yeah. it doesn't mean you're Nephilim. I mean, even the speculation of the Indian, the American Indian, when they would raise their hand, and, and we always see it in the Westerns, how? Well, the idea was you raised your hand to show that you only had five fingers. Right. Because the giants were, were not all giants had this, but they were known to have six digits on their hands and toes. So they would hold up their hand to say, I'm not a giant, I'm human. Right. right. See? Now, is that true or not well who buffalo knows buffalo bill. well buffalo bill wild bill cody uh had uh he wrote in his diary about the giants on the plains the right the pawnees he spent time with the pawnee nation and he in his thing he writes that the giants used to run through the herds of buffalo and pick up a buffalo under its oh, arm while nice. fighting off the leg of another one that's in his diary yeah so did he, you know, was he doing hallucinogenic drugs or, or was this, uh, this was a story that the Pawnees believed. Right. right. Okay, Gary. To back up what Pastor Bruce said, as common as anything in our culture that we just, everybody talks about, knows about, we just accept it as, you know, it's just, you know, that it's there. Being adopted Sue myself, the story about the five fingers, Pastor Bruce said, that is as common to the Native American peoples as anything in our. I mean, it's mm. just like, oh, oh yeah, we common. know that. They don't, even, they don't even question it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just an accepted, that's just yeah. the way it was. Right. And there's multiple, multiple stories all the way back about the red-headed giants with double rows of teeth that were carnivorous and the many mental conflicts and battles that they yep. went through fighting these guys. Right. That yeah. is in their historical culture yeah. as just totally, completely right. accepted fact. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and when we get, to, uh, we get to the Bible or we start reading Torah, there's a reason why he puts in there so-and-so the Tishbite, so-and-so the Moabite. Right. You know, right. we, we, we right. read all this because, uh, and then we find out, and then I think uh, the Jews do an injustice on it when they tell you, oh, well, they converted, yeah. you know, yeah. you know, yeah. they, they were act they were actually Hebrews or Jews because they converted, you know, uh, we don't read anything like that in there, but we do read that they were of a different, if you want to call it a different stock. Okay, Pastor Bruce. Oh, R H negative. Okay, R H negative. And this 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 site here, claim, some scientists claim that R H negative blood type people may not even be from Earth. <laughs> so, well, you know, well, I'm just saying. I mean, so I like words. that, Linda. So I, everybody. <laughs> Pastor Bruce said that, that he, there's comments that that blood type might not even be from Earth. And then Linda <laughs> says, we all we came from heaven. So, amen. Well, well, that's, 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 I know. That's technically true because the, that, the watchers came from heaven, right. intermingled, wow. and up comes the new blood type and, and the Nephilim. Okay, let, <laughs> let me move on because I, or I'm going to run out of time. <laughs> Okay, uh, Esau was apparently a skill was skillful with a bow and mainly in a manly a manly type of person. I think uh, I think today uh, they would be typically like today. Uh, there's a lot of sons that are jocks. You know, they're athletes and stuff like that. And uh, and fathers seem to you know they seem to like that. You know that they're boys play sports and you know stuff like that um then on the uh, you know on the other hand jacob was quieter and more sensitive things that mothers typically uh prefer today we would say that he was very studious you know 
in our family, uh, we like to tease uh, Peggy that uh, she's a nerd, you know, and they, they, they would say something because she, well, because she, she is very, you know, and I owe it to her. I mean, this woman, she was the first in her family to get a degree from college. So, uh, you know, that was unheard of until after she did it. Yeah, so that that is amazing. Uh, you know, notice our parallel once again with Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael was a favorite to Abraham. Isaac was a favorite to his mother. When God told Abraham that it was to be the second born Isaac that was to obtain the first born uh, position uh, that was currently held by Ishmael, Abraham cried out to God, oh, if only Ishmael could live in your presence. Uh, Abraham determined he wanted Ishmael as the firstborn. Isaac determined he wanted Esau as the firstborn. And neither of them would get what they wanted. Thank you. <laughs> you know? But uh, let me go back. Okay, did I give you number five? Yeah, a skillful hunter. Okay, number six, Esau sells his birthright to Jacob. Thus, Esau despises his birthright. Okay, you know, the time comes when Esau uh, comes into the tent from a hunt, and he is exhausted, and he sees that, uh, Jake, that Jacob had prepared a, a pot of soup, uh, or more literally translated, red stew. Jacob sees an opportunity to take the firstborn status away from his brother. Uh, Jacob decides he's going to help God out. <laughs> he's going to get Esau to openly and finally sell his traditional birthright to him. What is it that Esau says? Feed me because I'm about to die. <laughs> Okay, how many times have your children come in oh, yeah. to the house saying, I'm starving, you know? Esau was not about to die. This, this just shows how important, see, Maria is saying, yes, he was. <laughs> this, this just shows how important the birthright was to Esau. You know, jumping upon the opportunity, Jacob and Esau swear uh, while well, Esau swears his birthright over to Jacob. And the sages say that Jacob didn't trick his brother. He simply saw an opening and, and uh, yeah, he saw that opportunity and bam, he went for it. Pastor Bruce. It's not personal, it's just business. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a couple of weeks ago when I was teaching, I was teaching on the three times that, uh, one of the saints bought property in Israel, and it's contested to this day. Remember, right? Abraham bought Machpelah, yep. the land at Hebron, and we bought uh, Shechem, Shechem, um, and uh, and uh, David. And David bought the Temple Mount. Well, it all started right here because Jacob did not steal the birthright; it was sold to him and that same argument has prevailed for thousands of years now that you stole from me that's what right. the arab nations always say you stole from us yeah. and that's the root it's at least one of the roots of their bitterness today right they think that they were cheated by the descendants of the opposing side and but again we see it starts right here and Esau is going to come back later and accuse Jacob of stealing his birthright. When in fact, it says very clearly, he sold, sold it to it. him. Yeah. They even negotiated. You know, but as kids, you know, sometimes uh, you do things and oh, I really didn't mean that, yeah. you know, so, you know, that, that isn't what I meant, you know, and, uh, and then, you know, Obviously, um, Isaac had no clue what was happening at that time, you know, or uh, like I said, maybe his blessings would have been a little bit different. 
But then finally in verse 34, we're told that Esau despises his birthright, a very serious biblical condemnation of Esau. Uh, what a hurtful thing for Esau, knowing that from, from his point of view, his own mother was telling him that he would not be recognized as the firstborn. Okay, how else could it have felt that his mother was, was siding with Jacob? Because she, you know, she favored Jacob. Isaac favored Esau. All right, so uh, to think that Esau had no interest in having all the rights and power of the firstborn, frankly, it, it didn't, doesn't make any sense. So that's why I stated that uh, he probably was like, oh, I really didn't need that. You know, I was just hungry. I wanted something to eat. I just said anything you wanted to hear to, yeah. to, to get it, you know. So even though Esau told Jacob that he could have his firstborn rights, it's obvious he did, he did mean it because he was ready to walk, uh, or he didn't mean it, because he was ready to walk into his father's tent to receive his blessing. He just disregarded that as, you know, me and my brother, and eh, you know, uh, you know, he didn't take much to it, but you know, but you know, Esau did show how little he valued his birthright. So, okay, Gary, go ahead. What I was thinking is that Esau came to the immediate gratification of the flesh, mm -hmm. as opposed to the delayed gratification of the spiritual like and so many people now they want the the luxuries the benefits the money that this world has to offer and they will sacrifice the spiritual thing like get where it said about the things that are to come can't even compare with even the best things on on this existence right you know and so many people give up something so valuable that is eternal for a basically temperament or uh, for a bowl of, bowl of soup. physical satisfaction that may taste good going down but sours yeah. in the belly. Yeah. And it's a whole change of focus that Esau's view was immediate gratification of his flesh, whereas with Jake, his yeah. You was more of this, the spiritual as to yeah. what is going to come that yes. is eternal. Right. We get so sidetracked by our immediate gratification as opposed to eternal satisfaction. Right. Yeah, yeah. And and we see that because, and then later on, what, what we have, what a great thing we have is hindsight. Because in hindsight, we could look back and we yes. could read even in the, in, uh, in the, what, what people would call the New Testament, the Brihadasha, you know, where he says, where it says that, you know, Jacob, I love Esau, I hate it. You know, uh, I don't know if, 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 if he meant it to the point where, you know, I hate this guy, or if it's just one of these things where I don't like how he's acting, you know, and, but I do love the way Jacob is acting. I, I don't, go ahead, Maria. And then we're going to move on, Maria. Okay, where's the pastor? Oh, the pastor. Uh -oh. He knew you were going to ask a question, so he left. <laughs> I'm going to go in and get the pastor. <laughs> um, in, in one of his teachings, he said that Esau had been gone for days, weeks, hunting down Nimrod. And he went after Nimrod, and he hadn't eaten for days, right. and days, and days. And Nimrod was hunting Esau, and they got, oh, good, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> and they got, they got into a fight, and Esau killed Nimrod. And Esau staggered back to the camp. And that was the first thing he saw was his brothers cooking, and he was at the point of starving. Yeah. Not that I like him, two, really, he's not one of my favorites. Two <laughs> Jews, two Jews, three opinions. The other opinion that is out there. I live by his opinion. Okay. 
the other <laughs> the other opinion that is out there is all this happened during the time of when they were in mourning for Abraham. And you know, he hadn't eaten and he went in and so uh uh there's there's different ideas out there depending on if it's if you go to the midrash or uh or the talmud or you know there's uh, other you know jewish writings out there so i i i didn't go there with this teaching because i thought boy we have enough there with this already you know so uh but that's it with 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 chapter 25 let's go to chapter 26 Chapter 26 and letter B, uh, Isaac repeats Abraham's mistakes. Okay, but let's go, let's start here. In uh, Genesis 26, a famine is taking place. It's the second time we read about a famine taking place. In chapter 12 of Genesis, Abraham is faced with a famine in the land. Here in chapter 26, now it's Isaac that is faced with it, okay? What did Abraham do? You know, well, he went to Egypt, you're right. The similarities between Abraham and Isaac facing a famine in their lives is how Genesis 26 starts, okay? And it says, in, uh, now there was a famine in the land besides the previous famine, <coughs> that had occurred in the days of Abraham. Chapter 26 of Genesis is the only chapter devoted solely to Isaac. Out of all, if you notice, in all the other chapters, you know, there's different characters or there might be a different main character. This is the only chapter that uh, Isaac is, uh, is is the main character okay isaac is mentioned in other chapters as the son of abraham and sarah the father of jacob and esau but chapter 26 focuses solely on isaac isaac is the only pet patriarch like i said earlier who never left the land he was born in the land lived in the land died in the land and was buried in the land go ahead maria is this the same famine in verse 1 as it is in verse 12? Or is verse 12 a different famine? Um, I'm thinking, I didn't go there, but I'm thinking it's the same famine. Now, Isaac sowed. No, no, you don't think so? In okay. the land and reap the same year a hundredfold. No, it'd have to be a different uh, famine. You're going to Genesis 12? Yeah, same chapter. Yeah. So some say yes, and some say no. Okay, we're saying that the two different Well, it's just like Abimelech, yeah. You know, and when, when we get to Abimelech, it's a whole different Abimelech. It's just like the Pharaohs. When they start talking about the Pharaoh, and there was a Pharaoh that, you know, that did not know, know Joseph, it's not the, they're, they're not all the same feral. You know, you can't go 400 years with the same one. So, uh, you know, it, it's different. But let me go on. In this chapter, Isaac is distinguished as the son of Abraham. And we see that in verse 3, 15, 18, and 24. He also had, <clears throat> excuse me, he also had to deal with some of the same things Abraham, Abraham had to deal with. Uh, in, in the land of the Philistines, okay? The Midrash says that everything that happened to Abraham also happened to Isaac. That's interesting, okay? The land of uh, Canaan didn't get much rainfall, and since cultivation of the land depended on rainfall, famine was not unusual. So that's, you know, and we're hitting that. We're hitting the different times uh, that a famine hit hit the land. Uh, and if you ever uh, visited, uh, there's, there's many of us that have visited uh, Israel, and, uh, and even to this day, they, it's just like the Gaza. They'll tell you the Gaza at one time, uh, you know, thousands of years ago, was uh, richly, uh, uh, the land was just rich with nutrients and things grew there. 
Well, when you see pictures of the Gaza today, oh my gosh, you know, it's desolate. You know, it's, a, it's a, an area that, I don't even know if a cactus can grow there, you know, or, or tumbleweeds, you know, but, but, it, but it, it, it is bad. When Abraham encountered famine, he went down to Egypt. That's what we read in chapter 12, okay? When Isaac is faced with famine in the land, he decides to head to Egypt, just as his father had done previously. This was not according to the plan of God. The, you know, God had a different plan for Isaac. Isaac got as far as, as uh, Gerar, and God appeared to him with his word and his instructions, okay? Uh, and number one, God proclaims the covenant to Isaac. God promises Isaac all the blessings intended for his father Abraham and Abraham and all of Abraham's descendants. The promises God gave to Abraham was to continue his seed and family line, uh, make his descendants numerous. Uh, and how many times do we read that? Uh, that they would be, uh, you know, you can't even count the stars in the, in the sky, that his descendants would be like that, as numerous, okay? God had made the same promises to Abraham, God also expected Isaac to follow in his father's footstep. I don't know if he wanted him to follow in his footstep literally, because there are some things that he literally did that just wasn't right. Okay, there are numerous similarities between Abraham and Isaac. Okay, they both faced famine. Okay, they both decided to leave the land. They both are rebuked but rebuked by the ruler of the Philistines. Both were frightened for their own safety, and both passed off their wives as their sisters. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay. It appears that Abimelech at the time of Abraham and the Abimelech at the time of Isaac were not the same people. They were different. Pastor Bruce. You know, I was saying earlier that when we study the word, we want to study the essence. Yes. The, because uh, Itzhak is a type and shadow of Messiah. Yes. And yet we see here, he was afraid for his own life. Well, that doesn't work. He trades his wife off as his sister. That doesn't work. You see what I'm saying? So when you start taking the details and the exact specifics, and you're dissecting every little thing, things don't work. Whereas when you look at it more from the general and the essence of it, and what do we need to learn from this, now you can see Isaac is a type of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. You get into the details, there's no way he can be a type of the Messiah. Right, right. Okay, it, uh, many years had passed, uh, well, you know, let's let's uh, fill in number two. Abimelech takes Rebecca because Isaac says she is his sister. And then uh, number three, Isaac is rebuked by the pagan king just like his father was. So many years had passed between the time Abraham faced Abimelech, and the time Isaac faced Abimelech, quite a few writings indicate that they are not in the, the same so-called person. Some writings say that Abimelech at the time of Isaac is more of a title or an office, okay? Uh, you know, the same can be uh, said for, do you know how he, uh, the first Abimelech with Abraham had a, uh, a general, uh, a Fical, 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 P H I C O L, Picol, Picol, Picol. Both Abimelech and Picol are mentioned in chapter 26, 26, but they both are also mentioned at the time of uh, of uh, Abraham. 
Another school of thought suggests that since sons were often named after their grandfathers, it was probably not the same Abimelech that Abraham and Isaac faced. And, and this goes on. I don't know if any, anybody here have juniors in their family. You see, we, we continue yes, the yes. name, you know. Uh, yes, Maria. If you break down the name of Abimelech, the A-B is father, father, and Melech is king. king. Yeah. So it's just fun. Yeah. yeah. It's a title. It's a title. And that's what I feel. You know, the very first time I read this portion years ago, I thought that was the person's name. But I've come to understand that it's a title. You know. Let's look at Genesis 26, 15. Okay, it says, Now all the wells which his father's uh, servants had dug in the days of his father Abraham the Philistines stopped up by filling them with dirt. Okay, so uh, in Roman numeral four, Isaac digs the wells. He digs the wells of Abraham. Okay, digging a well was considered to be the equivalent to a claim of ownership. Okay, when you dig a well, you know, when he would find the water, uh, that was a claim there that Abraham, uh, and what, did, what was Abraham told initially? Everywhere you put your feet, that is gonna be your land, okay? Well, I think one way to try to get around it is, hey, let's fill up all these wells, as though he was never here, you know? <laughs> so, and as Pastor Bruce said earlier, you know, there's, uh, there's the big lie out there that uh, no, we, we own it, you don't own it, but yet land was purchased, uh, wells were dug, and, uh, ooh, somebody. you got it, huh? Okay, all right. So, uh, you know, it would allow a man to dwell on the land and sustain his flocks, his herds, okay? Rather than recognizing a claim to the land by an individual, digging of a well, the Philistines would wipe out the wells by filling them up, okay? In the valley of Gerar, Isaac dug a well that produced living water. Living water was water that originated from a spring, from a running uh, water. Living water was not water that was contained. So you had an underwater reservoir flowing and uh, so this was the type of wells that he would dig up. There was a dispute over the, the, that well, the other wells that Isaac dug, and he just moved on from wells that were disputed. If you read this portion, you would see that he would dig it up, and then the Philistines would come by and say, hey, that's our water, you know? Well, instead of fighting with them, he decided just to move on, and he would dig another one. Uh, and I don't know if that has any uh, uh, resemblance of what we were talking about earlier, being a mild uh, manner type person and not a fighter, because I think if that was Esau. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, so finally, a well was dug that brought about no opposition. My guess is that it was probably because of the distance Isaac had to travel to dig the well in order to get away from the Philistines, okay? Because Isaac finally digs a well, and he calls it Rehoboth, or Roch Rehoboth, meaning the hope Isaac had that this was a well, this well was dug in a place God had designated him to stay, okay? But it, it's my opinion, but after the well is, you know, that's just my opinion. But after the well is dug, uh, you know, there is no opposition. A strange thing does happen, though. Isaac's decision as to where he should stay was based upon finding abundant water and no hostility or opposition from the Philistine. But he digs a well that was uncontested, and we read that he moves. 
he moves to Beersheba. And there's no reason given. It's all it says in verse 23. Then he went up from there to Beersheba. You know, you find a place where there's no opposition. So, you know, like we said earlier, this must have been a God thing. You know, God tells him, okay, you found the water. Now get up and leave. Let's move on. <laughs> it says in Genesis 26, 22, then he moved away from there and dug another well. Okay, and they did not quarrel over it. So he named it Rehobo. For he said, at last the Lord has made room for us and we will be fruitful in the land. Though all the opposition Isaac had over the wells, he finally senses that God was guiding him back to the promised land. Now, here we go. Besheba was the first place that Abraham had gone with Isaac after they came down from the sacrifice on Mount Moriah. Okay, and that's in Genesis 22, 19. Isaac knew that God had promised to give him the land promised to his father Abraham you know and when you like I well, earlier I was talking about geography you need to understand that uh, where Abraham started and where Abraham ended and passed it on to that was a vast amount of land you can't look at Israel today uh, at this little piece there and that is that's what God is giving them well, yeah, God gave him that, but he also gave him all this, you know. So, uh, for, so for the Arabs to think that uh, that land does not belong to is, uh, Israel, they are wrong. You know, this, this land was promised to uh, Abraham and his descendants. Okay, so, uh, you know, and, and Isaac's decision to go to Beersheba, uh, must have been the right move because of what we read in Genesis 26, 24. In Genesis 26, 24, it, and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply uh, your descendants for the sake of my servant, Abraham. So. It, uh, it, it was the right decision for him to leave. Did I give you number four? Okay, Isaac digs the wells. Okay, number five, God blesses Isaac. Isaac makes peace with Abimelech. Okay, let's move on to uh, Genesis 27. And in Genesis 27, 5 to 7, Rebecca overhears Isaac tell Esau, bring me uh, venison and prepare a prepared food that I may eat and bless thee before the Lord before my death. Uh, Rebecca counsels Jacob to pretend to be Esau in order to obtain the blessing uh, in his you know, that his brother was about, was going to receive. So, uh, so what does she do? She dresses Jacob in Esau's clothing, you know, and, and I, I, I can only imagine what went on here. Yeah, you could wear the clothing. But one was hairy, right? Yes, one was very hairy, you know, so you got to do something, you know, uh, something to disguise. So uh, that's what she did. She disguised him by covering his arms in lamb skin so that if his blind father touched him, he would think Jacob, it, it would be <laughs> that it was Esau. So, okay, let me stop right there and let me see who was first, Bruce or Gary? Go ahead, Gary. What was mentioned earlier about Esau killing Nimrod the uh -huh. for the background, Esau or Esau killing Nimrod, right? Was that he recovered the holy garments, yeah. mm -hmm. which could have yep. been the garments back that yeah. God used to cover Adam and Eve, right? And could these garments that Jacob is using been those same garments? 
Yeah, you're right. It could very well be because there was a lot of power in those garments, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, Pastor Bruce? That's, that's what I was going to mention. That this is where the concept that uh, Maria was uh, talking about earlier, that Esau killed Nimrod. Uh, and these garments are thought by many of the Jewish scholars to be Nimrod's garments. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's designated in the way it is, the best garments. Um, if I'm not mistaken, there's actually a, a referral to this scripture in the Briha Shah as well, but I couldn't find it this morning. So uh, so the in the Briha Shah, the New Testament, it also speaks of, the, it mentions these garments again. So these garments have a, uh, a particular importance. Mm -hmm. Right. And this would be uh, kind of the prize of, oh, yes. of, of killing Nimrod. Yeah. You know, and the way sometimes you uh, read other, like, like Greek mythology. You know, when I was growing up, we had to take Greek mythology in, uh, in school. And you think of the, the Fleece of Hercules or, you know, and something like that. You know, there, there was, you know, if, if uh, she would put that on him and um, Isaac would think that Jacob was Esau, it worked. You know, there was something about that garment, you know, yeah, that. Two things. Okay, Maria. Um, when you read at that particular part in the Jewish scripture, it says uh, precious, precious garments. And when it comes to the garment, it has right before it, it has the olive and the top mm. and then garments. Yeah. And I went through the rest of the chapter and whenever it had garments, it did not have the olive and the top. And Pastor Bruce said that <laughs> this particular word has, they can't find a, a true meaning. Mm but it's something that must be sacred because it's like the beginning and the end, the, the alpha and the omega. So right. when it, they wrote the, and also the same thing for the fragrance that when uh, Isaac smelled e, uh, Jacob, it was the smell that came from Eden, the garden of Eden. Oh. And, uh, that fragrance or that smell is also with the olive and the top, only yeah. in that particular sense. Wow. Yeah, you know, I couldn't yeah. recall where uh, where I found it. I could, I know, a few years back we discussed this once before, and there was somebody who hid the garment, and I'm, I was trying to remember, you know, but I couldn't find it, so I I didn't bring that up. But there was someone who finally hid the garment because of its. Uh, back to Noah. No, this he was. Drunk, yeah. And the son saw the nakedness. At, at that point, this what he did was he took the garment. Yeah. No, it's. It was, yeah. And then that eventually ended up in Nimrod's hands. Yeah. yeah. And then Esau took yeah. it from Nimrod yeah. and then brought it at this point. I remember correctly, Pastor, we've got a better understanding. And then right. use the, these, these garments that God right. used to clothe Adam and Eve in the garden. Right. So but I know that. Down, yeah. But I know that one time we covered this, and we we're, uh, I don't know if it was Jacob who finally hit it, or if it was later on and it was one of the prophets. But uh, go ahead, Pastor Bruce. Yeah, just to expand on what Gary was saying, we weren't using a microphone, so they didn't hear that. Oh, mostly. okay. But um, but yeah, the, the the garments of Nimrod are uh, rabbinically traced back to the to being the very garments of Adam and Eve. Yes, that God literally uh, made for them after the fall and clothed them with. That's why they were so. I mean, garments of Nimrod in and of itself wouldn't be uh, a particularly precious thing. That's right. Uh, but the garments of Adam and Eve 
would be, I mean, can you imagine today if we had the garments of Adam and Eve, they'd be worth billions of dollars. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so they so, build a church on them. Yeah, yeah well, they would, for <laughs> <The> sure. <Catholic. laughs> <laughs> no, uh, so let's go on. J Jacob uh, brought Isaac a dish of goat meat prepared by Rebekah. Now, do you see anything different here? Before that, it was Jacob that was making uh, the meal. Now, uh, Rebecca is the one who cooks what Jacob likes to eat. Okay, Isaac then bestows the blessing, which uh, confers a prophetic wish for fertility and dominion on Jacob before Esau returns. Okay, Esau is furious. And he vows to kill Jacob. In Rome, Roman numeral, or no, in, in letter C, Rebecca and Jacob plot to deceive Isaac. There are many people that they, you know, when you read it, uh, they did this to deceive him. But yet there are many commentaries that say that there was no deceiving uh, involved. It was something that was ordained from God, and this is the progression. Uh, it was just, we, we covered it earlier where I said, uh, uh, if she had told her husband early on what the Lord told her about the two nations in her, and one and the older would serve the younger, would that have made, any, made it easier for Isaac to give the blessings to Jacob? You know, we don't know. We can only imagine, you know. But Roman, I mean, in number one, Esau vows to kill Jacob. Okay, Esau is furious and he, want, and he says he's going to kill Jacob. And that's in Genesis 27, 41. As soon as their father died. He already had the intentions. I won't do it while my father is alive. But once he dies, you know, I am going to kill my brother. Okay. Rebecca intervenes to save her younger son, Jacob, from being murdered by her uh, older son, uh, by what well, I should just say the elder son by what minutes, Esau. At Rebecca's urging, Jacob flees to a distant land to work for his mother's brother Laban, okay? She explains to Isaac that she has sent Jacob to find a wife among her people. And, you know, and this is important because one thing that Isaac and Rebecca didn't want is for their sons to marry Canaanite women, you know? And, and Esau did, it, it's like what Maria was saying earlier, that it was like uh, uh, Esau was in their face. He was this teenager that knew it all. And hey, you know, uh, you don't like it? Tough, I'm gonna do it, you know? Whereas I, uh, Jacob was more of in line with, uh, you know, yes, dad, yes, mom, you know? Okay, if, if you say so, then, then I'm not gonna let that happen. So uh, Jacob does not immediately receive his father's inheritance. Jacob, having fled for his life, leaves behind all this wealth. Remember, Isaac has flocks and land and tents, and, he, and that ends up being left in whose hands? Esau, okay? Jacob is forced to sleep uh, uh, out on the ground. And, uh, and work for wages as a servant for, uh, for Laban. So, uh, and uh, he works uh, for Laban, uh, what, seven years of service for what he thought was Rachel, okay? But then what happens? He's deceived, exactly. So he gets a little taste of his own medicine. Yep, yep, measure for measure, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, you know, so he marries Leah. But, you know, in, in hindsight, again, uh, it worked out better. And Rebecca never sees her son. That, yep, yeah, so yep. Yeah. Uh, in number two, Rebecca urges Jacob to leave. 
And then in number three, it's exactly what Pastor Bruce just said. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Rebecca wins, but never sees her I never sees Isaac again. You know, is that a a good victory? You win by passing on. But you know, but when she when when the blessing was passed on, it's not like uh you know, it's something that God told her way earlier, you know. So like I said, Rebecca win but never sees Isaac again. That you know, that is I, I don't know about you, but I, how many of you can go without seeing your grandchildren? You know, I mean, you know, we're so attached that, uh, you know, I, I, I can't conceive something like that. Go ahead, Maria. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about verse 33, where it says that Isaac trembled violently because from what, the little bit that I got, I couldn't find too much on it. It says that when he smelled Esau mm -hmm. and he trembled, it was because he smelled the gates of hell. Oh, I didn't read that. Did you guys hear that from Maria? That, uh, that and, you know, that, that was part of the trembling. It won't say it in the Bible. What she's going by is uh, some of the what the sages say. There's other uh, commentaries out there that uh, will discuss things further, and you just have to be careful. You know, some of them, um, you know, it makes for a good story, you know, kind of like. Uh, well, it was put in there for some reason. For some reason, you're right. And you either accept that he just sat there and had a little tremble, right. or he trembled for a certain reason. Right, right. right. Yeah. And, and, and you're right. It's, uh, I know I had something on that. But the other thing I had was in, when we get to uh, Genesis 28, uh, it's uh, Isaac's farewell. It talks about Isaac's farewell to Jacob. You know, when he, when he blesses him, he gives him instructions not to take a Canaanite wife. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and this is where uh, Esau uh, was in his own mother and father's face by taking two uh, wives from the, from the Hittites, okay? But then on top of that, he takes a third wife. He goes to, his, to Ishmael, his uncle, and he takes, uh, he adds another wife. So it was, this is something that Isaac and Rebekah did not want. But then when you think about it, you know, uh, they go back to the land, back to Laban, and uh, Jacob uh, ends up marrying Leah and then marries, uh, marries uh, Rachel, and, and he finally leaves. Uh, what, were, what was uh, Rachel and Leah? You know, they may not have been Canaanites, but they were from a pagan country. Okay, and what the rabbis say is they may have lived in a pagan country, but they were righteous in every way. So, Maria has another question. Okay. Esau married the third wife because uh -huh. he realizes that he should have married like Jacob was supposed to marry into the family. Right. Now, my question is, he married someone from the tribe of Esau, uh, from Ishmael. Right. Would she be considered a righteous bride for, for uh, Esau or for Jacob? Are, are we talking about who Esau married? Yeah. His third wife? Yeah, he married no. into the tribe of uh, Ishmael. Right. No, is it, that tribe considered uh, no, uh, suitable for uh, the son to marry into? No, no, they were not. Even though they were, Ishmael is <clears throat> Abraham's They son. were Canaanite women. Even Ishmael's tribe at that time, uh, all his tribe, they were considered to be Canaanite people. 
and he had already uh, married two Hittites, which were also considered to be Canaanite, uh, living in Canaan, okay, the land of Canaan. So that he was told uh, uh, even early on not to marry women there, but yet he did. And like I said, I think the third one was more of, well, if you don't want me to do it, I'm going to do it anyway. And uh, he married. <clears throat> well, well, you know what? I, I do have written here. Esau went to Ishmael. Esau avoided the Canaanite woman and married women from the family of his uncle Ishmael. But I don't think they were uh, women that were uh, like where Leah and uh, Rachel were from. No. They were uh, that. It was they were given the instruction. You're going to go back here. And you're going to bring a bride, you know, from. So she was still considered pagan because it said here that, that uh, yeah. uh, Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and went to Padan Aran. Right. So Esau saw that the daughters of the Canaanite displeased his father, uh -huh. Isaac, and he went to Ishmael. And that's where he got the bride, thinking that You're right. he can get into yeah. favor with his father by marrying in a chosen from a righteous bride. Yeah, and take a wife in addition to the wives he already had. Yeah, Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob. Now, the blessing and the birthright seemed important to Esau, okay? They were important enough uh, to him that he determined to impress his father by marrying, you're right, a non-Canaanite woman. Uh, when he saw that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother. So all along, Jacob, and you're right, uh, I was wrong. You're right. He, was, uh, he went, in, in order to impress his father, he figured, hey, I'm, now I'm going to do it right. But it was too late. Yeah, yeah. Pastor Bruce. Yeah, the of course the Torah hasn't been written yet, um, but in Torah, uh, an Israelite man is uh, allowed to marry a foreign woman. You're just forbidden from marrying a pagan. The difference is. Uh, pagans are actively worshiping demonic entities, whereas uh, a foreigner, just like today, most people are just secular. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if you go to, you know, India, probably most of the population. I don't. I'm not. Don't quote me on this, but probably most of the population there is not worshiping cows. They're, they're not really, they're Hindu in name only. Right. But they're not practicing. So remember, the, the Israeli men were allowed to take wives from the prisoners that they took. So they're allowed to take a foreign wife. And this goes to the heart of the issue of uh, Gentiles coming to faith. Those kind of outside, but not uh, seep in paganism. Mm -hmm. Follow what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. yeah. And this kind of addresses that pre Torah. Mm -hmm. She's a step up from paganism. Yeah, that would but be. But not one. on the level of, of uh, Rebecca and right. Raya. That would right. be a good way, I would yeah. think, of looking at it, yes. Yeah. You see, you said it better than I did. <laughs> I was, that's where I was trying to get to. You don't want to where, mess with Maria. Oh, I know it. Oh, I, know, I know that. Well, everybody, that's our Torah study for today.